Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, February 9th, 2021 Curriculum Subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Pursuant to that order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting laws requirement that public meetings be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as, as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public by, via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube and Comcast Channel 9. The public can access this meeting via this link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton channels. Um, so this evening's agenda, uh, we have four items, um, kindergarten and pre-K for 22 and 23, uh, middle school ELA curriculum adoption, uh, the Promise High School, and then, of course, any other business that needs to come before uh, curriculum. Um, and uh, that said, for our first item. Um, Mr. Mr. D'Agostino, I may have missed it, but um, the quorum, did we oh, take thank a you. roll call? I did not. Thank you very much. No, you didn't miss it. I did. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll call the roll to establish a quorum. Um, okay. The mayor... Had a prior commitment this evening. Um, so, Vice Chair D'Agostino, yes. Ms. Asak? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Mendez? Yes. Mr. Minicello? Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. All right, we've established a quorum. So that said, um, thank you, thank you, Mike, for no problem. Uh, so um, to go. start off, I'll let um, June, June, and Julian Andrad are uh, here. But just to preface this, um, uh, Masia Andrad Serpa, a director of the Parent Information Center, reached out um, to June and myself, um, just expressing. Uh, parents um, calling, um, asking about kindergarten for next year, and if they if they kept their children home this year, uh, and had them not go to uh, go to kindergarten, what would be our plan B going into next year? So, um, you know, June had to start working on what the numbers looked like. Um, so this is again, this is very early planning because uh, we, as we move through the planning process, uh, not only for kindergarten. Kid, uh, pre K and K, but um, for students one through um, 12, um, how we're going to um, develop our st summer programs for all of these students. And, and June will get into that for uh, this group. Again, this is very uh, early stages. And as we move forward to um, starting to plan and develop summer programs, we'll, have, we'll put task force together that you know, involves um, administrators, teachers, um, and obviously experts who are in that area um, and, and teach those, these students. And we'll have, you know, really develop robust summer programming for students, as you know, uh, to help with the recovery uh, from the effects of COVID uh, and remote learning and, um, and just, you know, and everything to do with not only academics, but social emotional support as well. So as we move through uh, the rest of the winter and into the early spring, we'll start putting task forces together to make sure that uh, we really build robust uh, summer programming for all students. Um, and so from here, I'll hand it over to June. Um, Mike, one thing I need to correct before June gets started. Um, I just learned that we are not on channel nine. We are on uh, channel 98. So I just wanted to get that in there. Thank you. 
Okay, great. So thank you and good evening, everyone. So as the superintendent said, we, we've been having discussions all along. As you know, we've had discussions about um, kindergarten in particular. And I'm sure you can appreciate this conversation, Mr. D'Agostino, given that you have a K student um, who's been participating in remote learning. And so we do recognize that, again, our teachers, our parents, our kids, they've done you know a tremendous job uh, during this period of school closure. And we have no doubt that our youngest learners, including our pre-K kids, but I'm talking about our kindergarten kids in particular, where they're really participating in a full day of remote learning, that we recognize that there are some students that um, that has been, and families and teachers, and that's been particularly challenging. And so we really did um, have a, we had a discussion last week, Marcia Andra, myself, Julie, um, today I furthered that discussion um, with Soraya uh, DeBarros, our director of community schools, who will obviously play a big part in being able to support what we're able to provide um, this coming summer. So we really just at this point started to think about what we could do to support what we're calling our rising first graders. Now we recognize that within the next couple of weeks that we're thankfully hoping that we're going to have our students, um, particularly our youngest pre-K and K students in person. That being said, um, that's obviously we're gonna be into March before that happens. So that really gives us a limited amount of time to have our kindergarten students participating in in-person schooling. And that's kind of what we're calling it. So we started to talk about what we could do this summer, um, not only about mitigating some of the possible gaps that our students, our kindergarten students could be experiencing, but also to be able to give them an opportunity to participate in in-person schooling for an extended period of time. And so we're talking about a five week, and again, as the superintendent said, these are preliminary discussions and, and we definitely uh, look forward to discussing this more in depth and, and we're planning to seek public input and certainly reaching out to the families and to the community. But the initial discussions have us kind of here and this is really more in line with things that we've done in the past. When you think about the programs that we've been able to support in the Brockton schools and in the community schools office around summer programming, we've had really robust summer programs. So this isn't something that we're new at. We have a lot of experience um, supporting summer programming for, for our students. The, the difference with this particular program that we're proposing is that it really is targeting a specific group of kids. Um, and it's a five, we're talking about providing a five week intensive program for our students who have completed the kindergarten remote learning year or, or they're going to be in person um, hybrid at least to begin with. But those are going to be the, the students that we're looking at targeting for the summer program are what we're calling our rising first graders. Um, and then toward the end during um, when we're done, we only have a couple of slides, we can talk about uh, what we're talking about. Again, initial planning for students who there are about 127 students who didn't participate at all in remote learning, um, kindergarten students who didn't participate, but some of them have participated in um, homes, they've been involved in homeschooling, and we're still investigating how many of those 127 students may have participated in some form of private kindergarten. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Julie, Julianne Andra. And she's just gonna talk about some of the rationale for why we think that targeting this particular group of students in this way will be important. So here's some of the rationale for establishing this summer program. It's early in their educational career, and some of our students have never been in a school building. Also, because of their young age, these entering grade one students are vulnerable, especially in regard to social and emotional development, and this could have long lasting effect without support. A smaller group setting will allow for targeted instruction, June had mentioned that as well, to address individual needs. And this program can importantly help to increase student self-efficacy by helping them manage new situations and develop a sense of control and mastery. This experience will help them get ready for grade one. 
And finally, the rising first grader summer program will provide opportunities for students to have successful experiences each day. Sorry about that. And so yeah, as, as Dr. Andrade said, you know, we, that's the, the rationale for moving forward with, with the program. Um, some things that we have to take into consideration as we develop the program is thinking about things like that, you know, what month would we, would we provide this um, in-person instruction in? What weeks you heard on that, or you saw on the first slide that we're proposing that it's about a five week program. We're also proposing that it's coordinated with community schools. And again, I talked with Soraya DeBarros about this today, and she was really excited about the idea of supporting a program for student, for kindergarten students, or rising first graders. Um, we know that we have additional Title I funds coming in, and we know that those funds can be used for summer programming. So we have some degree of certainty around having the funding to be able to support this type of program. And that will be really important because we're talking about a five day, a uh, five days a week, um, Monday through Friday. Again, hours, we're still working out details, but we're initially thinking a full day, at least nine to two, and that we'd really be relying on our schools and our teachers uh, and our parents to recommend the students who would benefit the most um, from attending this type of program. Um, we, have, uh, we have assessments that are in place already in our schools that we think that we'll really be able to rely on to help to inform those decisions. Um, we are also talking about ensuring that there's transportation. Of course, we'd have meals. Um, the, as far as staffing is concerned, we're initially, again, we're not quite, we don't have all of the details worked out, but we're getting there, but we're talking about, you know, one building and having a, a supervisory staff that's there just dedicated to this particular program. Um, we want to make the program as robust as possible, so as much um, like a regular school day as possible. So we'd be um, asking that we have specialists who would be on board. So the kids would be having, our students would be having the experience of health and music and art and phys ed. And we would want an adjustment counselor on board. Again, um, Julie mentioned social emotional learning and we'd really be relying on that staff, on staff to help support our students in that way. Um, including paraprofessionals. We're talking about maybe approximately 20 classes, but we'd wanna keep those class sizes um, as, as small as possible. Again, we want to be sure that we are providing our students with really de uh, dedicated and differentiated instruction, depending on individual student need. And then, we're, so th this would allow us to be able to accommodate up to 244 eligible students um, and again, we'd be looking uh, more deeply at what type of curriculum uh, we'd be using throughout the course of the summer. And so the superintendent mentioned pre-K pre at the beginning and, and part of our, our thinking around pre-K is we're hopeful that with Student Opportunity Act, if you remember, when we presented about the Student Opportunity Act a couple of weeks ago, we really had a focus on expanding the number of pre-K seats we were going to be able to provide um, in the fall. And so as, as we uh, get a clearer picture of what those Student Opportunity Act funds are going to look like, we'll be able to move forward on that too. So in that way, we're hopeful that we're able to support like we, we think about it's really three different layers of kids. We're talking about our entering pre-K kids, um, again, who we're calling our rising first graders. And, and then we, we're talking about the 127 some odd students who may or may not have participated in a kindergarten experience. And our recommendation for those students, again, depending on individual assessing of, of student learning needs, is that we would recommend that students who had no kindergarten experience this past year um, actually attend kindergarten in the 2021-2022 school year. So those are some of our initial thoughts and we're certainly happy to answer any questions. And then as we work out the details to come back to you with sort of further fine tuning of our plan.
And what we'll do is moving forward again, this um, will end up um, developing programs again for all summer programs for all students to um, be eligible for. Um, it's important and I think the state is gonna come out with some funding for summer programs. So we wanna make sure these programs are at no cost to the families. Um, and that summer programs, um, students have to, um, students with IEPs that have summer programming in their IEPs, obviously those will continue, but we wanna look at expanding summer program for all special education students, even if it's not in their IEPs. Um, we also wanna work with Kelly Jones and the bilingual department to develop um, a program for English language learners um, that's needed. Um, and also just, again, an, a program for all students who, who parents are looking for a robust um, uh, summer program to, again, and this is, uh, and our teachers, again, have done an amazing job with remote learning, but obviously there's gonna be holes that we need to fill in for our students. Um, and we're really looking to, you know, it, it could be, there could be several programs, run, there will be several programs running in a lot of our schools throughout the summer. And I think it's so important for us to do that. And um, June, myself, Kathy Moran, um, and Kim Gibson will start to work on a job ad to put together a task force that will develop these programs. Um, and then we'll you know, also that task force will help us develop the job ads that will go out. So the way the day is going to be structured, the curriculum that's going to be used and, you know, there's a ton of work to do. And I know the snow continues to fly, um, but, you know, we have to start planning these summer programs now. Great. I just have to shut my oven off. My apologies. <laughs> Or chicken nuggets or whatever that was before. <laughs> um, okay. Well, excellent. Um, do we have any comment or question from the members of the committee? I see Mr. Sullivan. Yes, June. The, uh, I know you mentioned 240 students. Is that including the 127 that I'm missing? No, no. The recommendation for that those 127 students, I mean, it could be some of them. But overall, our recommendation would be that if a kindergarten, if a student of kindergarten age didn't attend any kindergarten, that we would recommend that they um, that they enter kindergarten in the fall of 2021. Okay, so so if, is... if, if but there might there may be students of those 127 who withdrew for whatever reason and did actually have a kindergarten experience or are first oh, grade ready. So we'll have to assess students on an individual basis um, to be able to make those decisions in the okay, best interest of that particular student. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Sullivan, please. Hi, I just wanna thank Dr. Andre and June Saba. I love this idea. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We thought thank it was you, important. Judy. That's awesome to hear that back. We're very excited about it because I think it will really set our kids up for success, you know, especially our youngest learners. Yes. And, and if anybody, you know, it, it covers everything. If anybody is lagging before the school year starts, yeah. it's a great idea. Yeah. And we really see it. with summer programs, too, that kids that participate have that extra confidence, too, when they go back. Yeah of, you know, just even uh, manag managing a school day. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So we did think it was really important to focus on this particular group of kids. And as the superintendent said, this isn't the only group of students we're going to offer summer programming for, but this is more just like a, a specialized approach to a group of students. Yeah, because this past summer, um, we did run programs at I think five schools. Uh, where teachers, adjustment counselors, our mentors were involved, uh, students that were really, really struggling with, um, you know, with the effects of COVID. Um, those are programs will continue to run. I think there's, you know, you can never have enough programs because um, you have to kind of tailor them to the individual needs of all us, you know, that our students have. Um, and we're going to do our best to do that, at, at obviously, a, on a wide scale. Um, and again, we do have the Title I money coming in um, through the latest um, uh, stimulus package, but we're also hearing that the Department of Education is going to provide uh, grants for summer programs as well to help districts recover from COVID. So uh, we're looking forward to building these, um, building these programs for our students and families. 
All right. Yeah, no, I think this makes a ton of sense. Um, you know, I've definitely heard people concerned about, you know, are their students going to be ready for the next grade? So, um, you know, there's definitely a need. Um, I'm glad we're being proactive about this. And, you know, to the superintendent's point, I think uh, certainly there'll be other groups of students that are going to need, you know, an opportunity like this. But, um, you know, as, as as per usual, we, you know, Brockton Public Schools is on it and putting something together. I think it's a great idea and uh, appreciate the, the work you've done so far to get this thing going and um, look forward to seeing more on it. So um, any other member of the committee? <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, so if there's nothing else on this topic, we can move on to item number two, middle, uh, middle school ELA curriculum. So Mike, do you want me to jump in? Okay, so yep. um, so Eileen McQuaid is here with us this evening. Eileen is our associate principal over at the Ashfield Middle School. She is also our ELA content lead for the middle schools. So she gets to serve dual purposes. And um, she is going to take us through this evening the process that she led at the middle school level to select uh, an ELA core resource for the middle schools. And I know if you remember, I think it was a year ago this month that we had the um, school committee retreat at West Middle School where Eileen and, and the rest of the group, um, the content leads got to talk about the focus that we've had on ensuring that at the middle school level that we were focused on selecting and implementing high quality research-based resources. And if I remember correctly, Eileen, you did launch or uh, explain what the process is that we were going to be using. And um, I think that it is no small feat that Eileen has been able to lead this process even during a pandemic. And so what you're going to hear from her this evening, again, is the process that she used. Um, again, you'll hear about the inclusivity of the process. And hopefully at the end, when you hear the, um, the resource that the uh, curriculum team led by Eileen selected, um, you'll uh, be, I, I think, be uh, satisfied or happy or uh, you'll, you'll support the decision. Um, because we we definitely have a lot of confidence in the process that was used. So Eileen, um, okay, off to you. Thank you, June. Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen and um, show you a PowerPoint that explains the process that we went through. This process was um, it, a year and a half in the making and it uh, wrapped up in uh, January of this year. And um, everybody who was involved, I'm pretty sure, uh, came out of it thrilled with um, the results. So uh, let's take us back. Um, in uh, September of uh, 2019, we joined um, many other districts to learn a process for selecting curriculum and using products um, at, sorry, for selecting curriculum products using an inclusive, transparent and data-driven process from DESI and Ed Reports. So those three words were really important in the process. Uh, people, lots of people had to be involved, all the stakeholders, it had to be transparent. Um, I, all the teachers were told about this process in October of 2019, and it had to be data driven. So the lead um, with DESI uh, for this process was an organization called Ed Reports. And if you can imagine, just like when you buy a new TV or new um, laundry, uh, you know, washing machine or dryer, you don't always know maybe what the best ones are. And so you'll go to consumer reports and they use a certain uh, criteria and then they will rate what that, um, what that product is good on, the, on that criteria and give it a rating. And so um, Ed Reports is doing the same thing. And the reason why we needed that is because since 2011, when the first Common Core 
uh, when Common Core was first adopted in this country, um, lots of publishers were slow to um, be able to provide schools and educators with good curriculum products that were aligned to the new Common Core. And so um, once Ed Reports came out with these kinds of ratings, um, you saw publishers really respond to it. And in the past three years, we can see, whereas before there were not a lot of good quality products out there, now there are quite a few. So what are the criteria that they use to evaluate curriculum products for people? They look at text quality. They look at whether or not those texts, when children read them, they can build knowledge for students. And then whether or not they're aligned to the Common Core state standards. And then finally, usability. Is it easy for a teacher to use the product? Is it easy for students to access and use the product? So after um, many meetings, we said, um, okay, so the first thing they said was, we want you to refine what your vision was for Brockton for ELA instruction. And so this was our vision. We said teachers will deliver instructional excellence by requiring students to engage with high quality grade level text to support students' ability to read critically, build arguments, cite evidence, and communicate ideas in order to participate in a democratic society. So that was, that was um, what we used, that's our vision, and that's what we um, kept in, in, in the forefront of our minds as we went through this process. The next step was for us to, um, in, uh, with all of the members of the department, remember being inclusive was an important part of this process, we had to come up with, um, a set of uh, curriculum priorities. So we set out a survey and um, we asked um, all ELA teachers across the district, uh, what are the priorities in the curriculum uh, materials that we choose? And they said, they need to be aligned to the common core standards and shifts. They need to include diverse texts that are culturally relevant to our student population. They need to be both digital and print materials. And we did not know how important this digital piece was going to be when we first talked about this pack in October. Um, the next uh, priority is that we need to include strong supports to teach writing. We needed to include strong teacher guidance and training. And we needed to have strong supports for English language learners special education students, and also enrichment for advanced students. So those were the six priorities that the department came up with as important and that we needed to find those uh, curriculum uh, products that met these requirements. So then we began our search. Uh, we had a steering committee and between October of uh, 19 and uh, January of 20, this small group of teachers reviewed 12 highly rated products from uh, Ed Reports. And we used our curriculum priorities and we evaluated them. We looked through each one of them and we found evidence and we said, yes, it meets this criteria or no, it doesn't. And then we finally narrowed it down to two different choices. The first choice is study sync. And the next choice was amplify ELA. Next, we had teacher training. Between January of 2020, before schools closed, and September of 2020, when all schools were closed this, this fall, um, every ELA and ESL teacher got six hours of training in both programs. We had the consultants come out and work with us in person in January of 2020 and remotely, and um, all teachers got um, really terrific uh, uh, and repeated uh, training in each one of those programs. Now, why is that really important? Is because um, our teachers really needed something that they could use with their teachers remotely. And these were wonderfully um, highly rated, robust and free <laughs> um, resources that we could use because we were piloting them um, with uh, the aim of purchasing one of them. So both companies knew what our process was and both companies were terrific in, uh, in giving us the training and giving us these products for free during this really critical time. 
So then um, what we did is um, we talked to the department about how each one of these products rated against our criteria. Remember, the first one was they had to be aligned to the common core state standards and shifts. So here you can see study sync met the expectations for that alignment. And then we also needed them to be diverse texts. And you can see they're green. They are um, the most highly rated that you can be for um, having diverse texts for our students. So next we look at Amplify ELA, same thing. They met the expectations for alignment and they met the expectations for text quality. Thank you at reports. They did a great job um, uh, of evaluating these two products in those regards. The next thing is we said we have to have print and digital. Students are going to be um, using, especially now that we're a one-to-one -one district, they're gonna be using um, uh, products with, that are online. They're going to be able to engage in text online. And, um, but we also felt like, you know, there are some times that, you know, our a network can go down or a student doesn't have access to their tablet. They left it at home or it broke for whatever reason. So we, we felt it had to have the, pr the print um, part as well. And both of these, the steering committees looked at both and said, yes, every single piece of the program in Study Sync is available in both print and digital, as is Amplify ELA. The next criteria, so there you go, your check marks. The next criteria is supports for writing and study sync. So uh, we had to, uh, if, if you look at the, these are criteria from Ed Reports and they looked at this for us and, and evaluated it on this criteria, that during culminating tasks, students engage in a wide range of writing. And so that wide range is argumentative, essays, literary analysis essay, informative essays, and narrative pieces all along to the common core. And we also know that they have to have a mix of on-demand and process writing involved there because students will be doing both on-demand on, on MCAS and process writing um, during the school year. And then we also um, really liked this part that they are evidence-based writing, that all students are um, are going to be able to make claims and support them with evidence from the text. They have to um, support careful analysis, well-defended defended claims, and clear information. So we thought they got two out of two. They got 100% for study sync in those three really important parts of any writing curriculum. And then if I looked at Amplify ELA, you could see they were also um, highly rated and got basically 100% scores on them. So now it's time to pilot. We see that we've got these two highly rated uh, programs, but we don't know necessarily which one we want to pick until we get these into students and teachers' hands. So every single ELA, ESL, and SPED teacher in all ELA classrooms were given the opportunity to volunteer to participate in the pilot every teacher, SPED, ESL, and um, um, ELA teachers. Go ahead, everyone can pilot it. And nobody was barred, but the only thing is that if they decided to pilot, they had to agree to really important um, things that they would do in the pilot. You had to pilot both programs. You couldn't just pilot one. We thought this was super important because how could you judge one to be better than the other unless you had done both programs? Next, you had to fill out a rubric and uh, give us evidence to support the scores that you put on that rubric. Next, you had to agree to pilot study sync in October and amplify in November. Then you had to, sorry, then you had to participate in a consensus activity where we all come together after the pilot and decide as a group which pr um, program to purchase. And remember, the only people who can decide and be part of that consensus activity are people who volunteered to pilot. So we started the pilot in October. Who volunteered? We had 14 grade six teachers, 10 grade seven teachers, 18 grade eight teachers, 
20 ELA teachers, nine ESL teachers, and six special education teachers for a total of 34 teachers. So we had a really nice, I think, cross-section of all the teachers and um, the three different uh, sort of uh, sub and disciplines involved. So this is um, what happened. After the pilot, we collected and we analyzed the evidence. So remember, ease of use was one of the things that we were looking at. And so we asked teachers, um, was it easy for you to navigate the program, create assignments, assign differentiated supports, monitor student pro progress? And did you think it was flexible enough so that you could revise them to the needs of your students? And then is it easy to grade and give feedback? So all of those things for teachers and students, we asked them to give a rating and to also give some evidence to support their scores. And as you can see here, StudySync had an average rating for ease of use as for 4.1, and an average rating for Amplify came out to be 2.93. The next uh, category on the rubric was, does it have good supports for special populations, okay? And we can see that StudySync came out with a score from all 34 teachers, an average score of 4.1, and for Amplify, an average score of 3.17. And then we asked about teacher guidance and training. Remember, that was one of our curriculum priorities. We see Study Sync came out with a 4.3, and Amplify came out with a 3.87 average score for teacher guidance and training. So if you look at during the pilot, we had teachers look at all three of those categories when they were piloting it. And Study Sync came out with an average of 4.2 overall score and Amplify, their average rating was a 3.16. So I collected every single comment for every single uh, category um, that teachers were judging the products against. And I put all of their, uh, copied and pasted them, it was a job, and put them all together and then gave them to all of the participants who were in the who were uh, participating in the pilot. So not only did they see the scores, but they also saw the comments that every single person did um, for uh, the evidence and the comments that every person used to support those scores. And then overall, the people who rated study sync as the best overall program, it was 30 people on the on the um, rubrics. And the number of people who rated Amplify ELA, the better uh, program overall, was four. So you would think, okay, we're done with the process. Yay, right? But remember, we had a process that said, you've got to build consensus. And so um, let's talk about that for a second. With voting, majority determines the decision. And we love voting because it's familiar, it's efficient, it's conventional, and it's useful with time constraints. Um, but what's the problem with voting? It doesn't encourage interaction and it creates winners and losers. So consensus is better when you're trying to adopt a program that you want every single teacher to get behind, that you want every single teacher to have buy-in, and that you want every single teacher to have faith that this is the best program for their students. It's best to have a consensus. So how do you do that? All team members, what's the positive? They have to agree to support the ultimate decision. Why is that good? The best decision for the group rather than a personal preference. All perspectives are taken into account. What's kind of a negative to that is that it's time consuming and it can be contentious. So we had all that information. I shared it with all the pilot and then we set up to have our consensus meeting and it got canceled once, it got canceled again, you know, because of snow and things like that. And then we finally had our consensus um, Eileen, activity. can I ask one question? Yeah. Was that Jack Klugman in, in, in one of those pitches there? Yes, because <laughs> this is this is the angry 12 angry men, right? All right yeah, okay. and so there's quite a few stars in that picture, yeah, actually. A, yeah. All right. I, 
<laughs> so we're not voting. I, I remember. We're, we're, I remember him as Quincy, but we'll. Yeah. We're, <laughs> I, okay. digress, I digress. I remember from the odd couple. Anyway, so in any event, they had to come to a consensus, right? A hundred percent agreement on on whether or not to convict, and it's sort of the same idea. That consensus, that one hundred percent agreement. So, what? How do we do this consensus in small groups? Teachers um, discussed the choice of their curriculum resource, and they presented re reasons as evidence to support their choice. And then the groups reported out to the whole group. And so this is what I asked teachers to do. Afterwards, they would have to um, choose one of these um, uh, cho choose one of these descriptors as to where they felt after that discussion, okay? And one of them was, I enthusiastically agree with the majority. You had me at hello. I agree with the majority. My voice was heard. I agree with the majority with reservation. However, I will support the group. Then I'm unsure on the line. Let's keep talking. I disagree with the majority. My buy-in is weak. Let's keep trying. I disagree with the majority. Not all voices were heard. Let's keep trying. I enthusiastically disagree with the majority. Uh, let's keep trying. So um, everybody got into their groups and then we reported out and then I um, had everybody choose where they stood um, with this consensus activity. And um, what happened was, let me get to my next slide. I am freezing. Okay, there you go. What happened was 22 people came up with enthusiastically agree, 11 agreed, one person with reservation. And so because we were able to get everybody in the green in one side, we came to consensus in the, uh, you know, the consensus was, of course, to get study sync. So that was our whole process. Thanks for listening to it, everybody. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, great. Thank you so much for the presentation and for joining us tonight. <clears throat> um, so I can, I'm trying to get everybody back on my screen, which I don't. I'll stop sharing. Mark, I just have a couple comments. All right, why don't we start with the superintendent then um, it up for questions. Thank you. So I just wanna thank the Office of Teaching and Learning and Eileen and all the teachers that um, participated in this. Um, you know, I, those of you who don't know Eileen well, I mean, I worked with her um, back in 2001 when I first went up to Brockton High School from, from East. And um, you're not gonna get a, uh, anybody in the district that works harder than she does. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, we have, a, I'm not, and I don't mean it in a way that other people, everybody works hard, but you know, she's right up there with all, you know, with everyone. If you pick people that work the hardest, she's right there. Um, she's never um, asked, you know, she's never been given a task that she refuses to do. Um, and she works well, she supports teachers and administrators. Um, and I can't say enough of the service, her years of service with her. And she's not going anywhere. I just wanted to publicly thank her for all she puts in. And I've seen it, you know, 20 years ago at Brockton High and, and continues to this day. Uh, as you can see, the process she went through, very inclusive, uh, very transparent. And um, that's how we need to choose curriculum. And just quickly, um, in the piece that she mentioned, and it can't go unnoticed, is, is when you're choosing curriculum now and, and is about the diversity and making sure there's no um, bias in the curriculum, racism. Uh, those things have to be very carefully vetted and looked at. Um, and it's important to use um, with the Department of Education, uh, the tools that they provide us with um, in ed reports. So again, those are the important things to remember. It's, it's, this is a very daunting task, picking out curriculum and to make it um, put that much time into it by her and all the teachers and everybody involved, I just want to say thank you to you all. Um, and not only now that you know that piece of very hard work is done. Now the the, the real hard work begins is the implementation of new curriculum. That's exactly right, Mike. I mean, thanks for saying those nice things. That's great. I think the teachers deserve most of the credit because honestly. It, they're in a pandemic, they're trying to teach all of these different things. And then on top of it, we're asking them to try this new program and that new program. But what you're Absolutely. saying about um, 
uh, yeah, now that I look back on it, that was the easy part because now the implementation is going to be the part that's really going to um, be the hard work in the next uh, year, a year and a half. Yeah, and again, right, you're right. Asking people to do this during a pandemic and them stepping up to do that is is, is just amazing. So they were thank you all, and I'll shut up now so the rest of the committee can ask questions. Well, and I would remember the superintendent's comments. We appreciate all the hard work you've put in and all the teachers that have been involved. Um, obviously, this is, you know, an extremely important um, thing you're doing to pick a new curriculum, and there's a lot to it. And um, I mean, but I mean, this really is, I can't stress important, you know, picking curriculum, I'm sure, you know, I imagine is, uh, we're going to put this in front of all the kids in our district and you know, we have to get this right, basically. So um, I applaud the the lengthy process you put it through because, again, if we get this wrong, there's there's going to be consequences of it that we don't that we don't want. Um, and um, to to you know what um, we found out after we went through this whole process is that Boston. Um, sort of at the same time and they decided to get study sync as well and that made us feel like oh good another big urban district had the faith in this program so it did make us feel better because because you're right it, it it's a it's a daunting task and you want to get it right because you want to put the best things in the hands of your teachers so that your kids get the best instruction possible right um one and i apologize i probably should know this but and maybe you covered it so we're buying a new curriculum for middle school ELA. So uh, when you say that, I mean, like, what do we have now? Are we replacing software we use now? Are we replacing old textbooks we use now? Like, what are we actually doing? Um, we're replacing a myriad of um, textbooks and novels um, that, that uh, teachers were using before. And all of them were paper products. We needed to get into the digital world. And so this is our big step forward that way. Okay. And, and I was wondering too, is it, so this is all, is it a hundred percent digital? Is there any still, you know, old school traditional with a book? So the whole entire um, uh, curriculum students can access digitally and or paper. So if your teacher is doing an, uh, an assignment uh, digitally and, and for whatever reason, uh, you don't have a tablet or, or um, internet or you just choose, you know, you could do it on paper instead if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I was just curious. And maybe this is just, you know, pardon the term, but maybe I'm just an old fart, but it seems like, you know, we don't want to, you know, this, obviously we need to embrace digital. And as, as Mr. Minicello has pointed out in the past, you know, this is the new pencil and paper, you know, um, but at the same time, there's something to be said for physically sitting and reading, you know, a text too. So anyway. So that's what, exactly what we thought. And that's why that was one of our priorities that the whole district came together and said, we don't want to just digital. We, we don't want just paper. We want to be able to have the choice. So I, I, I agree. Excellent. Thank you. you Any other members of the committee want to weigh in questions, comments? I don't see uh, Mrs. Sullivan. I just want to thank um, Eileen McQuaid. That, that was a great presentation. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Diagostino, I also just wanted to thank um, Eileen. Thank you again for the presentation. Um, it was very informative. Um, and we do appreciate all the hard work that went into preparing that for us. Thank you. Thank you. How is Joy? I don't even see Joyce on the screen anyway. <laughs> She's the logo one. I'm the logo. Oh, gee. The logo one. I'm looking for your name and I didn't see it. Okay. I'm a little mysterious tonight, Mr. Like, Hagerstein. Where did Joyce come from? I, don't even, I didn't even see, see her on the screen. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for your time tonight and all the effort that went into this and, and for your presentation. Um, if there's nothing else from the members of the committee, and it looks like there isn't, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which is Promise High School. And uh, shall I assume that the superintendent is ready to run with that one? Sorry, um, Sharon Wolder is with us, uh, Chief oh. of um, Student Support Services. And um, she's going to fill you, just give you an update. Kelly Silva will be with us in, Mar in March. To, um, she's meeting with Bar 
the Bow Foundation again um, within the next two weeks, and she'll give us an update in March. So Sharon's just going to give you a, um, a quick update on the work that Kelly has been doing with her team and with Sharon uh, in the development of the new Promise High School. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Um, and as Mike said, Kelly will be here with a PowerPoint and uh, a very detailed presentation for you in March. Uh, but we just wanted to give you some information thus far because it was mentioned a couple of weeks, a few meetings ago about uh, Promise High School being located in the Goddard building and that building as it's being um, renovated. Um, the community center and promise sharing the space. So we wanted to just give you an update. Uh, three years ago, we applied for the opportunity to open a new high school uh, using a model that uh, is different and is very individualized for students. And we won that grant through the Bar Foundation and that opportunity to start to develop the school. So for the last year and a half, uh, Kelly was identified as the uh, design lead and uh, principal of Promise High School. And last year, she spent the full year uh, working on the development of that with the Spring Point Foundation and Bar Foundation, uh, developing um, a personalized model for students and using um, uh, developing TLEs, which is a form of uh, instruction that is interdisciplinary for all curriculum areas. And so she'll go into details and give you examples of that uh, when she sees you in March. And uh, we were granted a second year of planning for this school year uh, through the Bar Foundation, again, funding all of the planning and continuing to work with Spring Point um, in the development of the school. Um, Kelly has uh, worked with some consultants as well as Spring Point and Bar to design the school and to uh, determine how it's going to function. The plan is to start next year with ninth grade, only ninth grade, uh, and she'll build ninth grade, 10th grade and move forward that way. And uh, looking at starting with approximately 50 students for the first year um, and using an advisory model an interdisciplinary instructional approach. It'll be a competency-based school. And one of the key components of the school is financial literacy. And so everything that students do, uh, understanding finances, understanding how uh, economies work and their place in the economic world as well as the social world is going to be part of their learning experience. So, uh, if you have specific questions, I'll be glad to answer as many of them as I can, uh, but just know that she'll be here with a detailed presentation moving forward. But the goal is to open uh, with 50 students in September to uh, when the building is at a place where the, an open house can be held, held and we're in a place where people can actually come on site. Uh, she will plan to have an open house. It will be uh, an application process. Uh, the application will include interviews with both students and parents. And the goal hopefully is to have parents as involved in some of the work, uh, especially with the financial literacy piece as the students. Great, excellent. Well, thank you Mrs. Walter for your time and for joining us tonight and, and for that update. We appreciate all the, the work you're doing on this. Um, is there a member of the committee that has any comment or question on this item? Looks like Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Mrs. Walter. I was on the renovations. Will they be done by the start of school year this year coming up? I believe so. And the superintendent can probably answer that question better than I can. Uh, but I know that they're in progress and uh, Kelly has been over, I've been over. Uh, there have been uh, a couple of planning sessions. Uh, the fitness center that we are hoping to put in there uh, we, is underway in terms of getting the equipment. And so I don't know if the superintendent wants to jump in on that a bit and give more details. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, they should be ready by right around um, probably second week of March. Um, you know, the, and again, I just want to be clear that we right now are only using the, the, the first floor 
um, because that's the only floor that is accessible, handicapped accessible. Um, we are going to, as the mayor has uh, uh, spoken to us before, we'll be, we'll be meeting, uh, having the facility subcommittee meeting. He is, um, has been committed to um, putting, um, finding funding this budget season to put an elevator in. So we'll be able to use more of the school as we move forward, but that's definitely in the plans. Um, but right now we're just renovating the first floor. Um, so, cause again, that's what's accessible for, um, for you know, um, handicapped accessible. Thank you. Great. Welcome. All right. I think we have Mrs. Sullivan as well. Hi, um, Sharon. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just wanted you to, um, explain a little bit further what interdisciplinary and competency-based is? So, question. okay. So uh, interdisciplinary is, is an, an approach that instead of just saying English is English and history is history, uh, you may have uh, the English and the history teacher working together uh, so that as students are developing their their English skills, they're also learning the history. And so that approach will be used uh, and where financial literacy is infused in every aspect of what we do uh, in education, it instead of implying it, it will be, it will be uh, demonstrated for students and it'll be a deliberate approach to making sure that they understand why they're learning, what they're learning and how it uh, will benefit them, not just in that moment to get a grade, but as they move forward and prepare for college or career. And Thank what you, I think you had two questions. Competency-based was? So uh, the grading system oftentimes is just, uh, the way typically is done is that you have a curriculum, you do an assignment, you get points for that assignment, and and it, you know you get graded that way. This approach is a standard that you are expected to meet, and as you're progressing toward the standard, you're assessed on that, uh, and so you have to reach a level of competency in those standards before you move on. Okay, I get it now. Thank you. Um, how will students be picked for this okay, program? Um, we, do, we do have an application that will go out uh, probably in April um, and students will apply. It will be rising ninth graders who, who will be invited to apply. Um, and so they will complete the application and the interview process. Um, what we anticipate is uh, a number of students who, you know, a very large high school may not be the best fit for them or a different approach because there is an advisory built in every day for this. Uh, so a smaller, um, more personalized and different approach to learning may be a better fit for them. Uh, they may find that uh, choosing promise might be a better pathway than, than uh, the other options they have available in the community. And ultimately, uh, we need to be able to offer more ways to get to your diploma um, because students are looking for other ways. And we oftentimes lose students to charter schools and, and to uh, vocational schools that could very well stay right here in Brockton and have a different experience. So it would be another pathway added to Absolutely. Our path, our path, and, multiple pathways that we already have, right? Yes, definitely. And it, would, it wouldn't be repeating anything that was done at the Champion High School? No. Okay. Champion is also a choice school and yep. uh, people need to understand that it's a choice and that um, that is definitely another one of our uh, choice high schools in this community. Right, great, thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. Any other members of the committee? Have any comment or question? All right, thank you, Mrs. Walder. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, okay. So we are on to other business. Is there any other business for the curriculum subcommittee this evening? Um, no, uh, Mr. Yagasino, there's nothing else, thank you. Nothing else for the superintendent. If no member of the committee has anything, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. 
Second. We have a motion to adjourn by Mrs. Sullivan, properly seconded by Ms. Asak. I'll call the roll. Vice Chair is a yes. Ms. Asak? Yes. Mrs. Mendez? Yes. Mr. Minichello? Yes. Um, Mr. Rodriguez? I'm sorry, I think he had, uh, he told me he had to hop off. He had another obligation. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. And uh, Mr. Sullivan? Yes. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you for your time. See you all at seven o'clock for another round. <laughs>